today. Uh, this is a fresh start for us, and we want to go big. We want to go high. We want to go intentional. So would you close your eyes with me and pretend that you are on a new journey and listen very carefully. Good evening and welcome to Flight 2021. We are prepared to take off into the new year. Please make sure your positive attitude and gratitude are secured and locked in the upright position. All self-destructive devices, pity, anger, selfishness, and resentment should be turned off at this time. All negativity, hurt, and discouragement should be put away. Should you lose your positive attitude under pressure during this flight, reach up and pull down a prayer. Prayers will automatically be activated by faith. Once your faith is activated, you can assist other passengers who are of little faith. There will be no baggage allowed on this flight. God our captain has cleared us for takeoff. Using the runway marked Romans chapter 8, we are going to launch into this next new year. Buckle your seatbelts. There may be air turbulence, but our captain is Jesus, co-pilot is the Holy Spirit, and you're in good hands. Our destination, greatness. Wishing everyone a new year filled with new hope, new joy, and new beginnings. Stay blessed and welcome to 2021. Hey, hey, thus saith the Lord in Romans 8 for us. So as you came in, you got a handout, and uh, the handout basically presents just Romans 8 right before us. And those of you that were with us last semester, you know we ended kind of on a down note. We left Paul um, in a frump. And I think every woman of God, every woman on the face of the earth knows what, what it feels like to be there, to be discouraged. And sometimes we can be very discouraged on the things going around us, but oh my goodness, when we're discouraged of what's going on in us, that can sink our ship. Amen? Who wants to say that? Amen. So if you have your Bible with you, would you open to Romans 7, because we're going to back up the truck just a moment and catch his thoughts of where we did leave him in a dark, dark night of Paul's soul. And he says in verse 18 of Romans chapter 7, he says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. And probably is thinking, I've, I've lived to prove it. And other people have seen it. Nothing good dwells in me, for to will is present with me. But how? If you ever pin, circle that word how. That how is the hard part, right? You, we can want to do the right thing, but the how just escapes us. How to perform what is good, I don't find. For the good that I will do, I don't do it. But the evil that I will do, I practice. And practice seems to make perfect <laughs> or not perfect. Now, I do what I will not do. It's no longer I who, who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So that's where we kind of left him. He did have a breakthrough in his last words, and he, he did say, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me? And then he says, I thank God through Jesus. And that was the lifeline that he held on to. And Romans 8 is the continuance of that. And we feel his groan of that internal failure. And I can say that, that that's common with me, uh, just, just in those dark moments where I say, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? Some of you might be young Christians. Maybe you're here this morning, and I hope there is somebody that's not quite there, and you're interested, you're, you're being drawn by God. But, but I've been walking with the Lord for 50 years. You, you'd think I'd be perfected. Um, what's wrong with me? It was painful for him because he had tried his whole life. And quite frankly, he was a better trier than I am. He had such a background of spirituality. But he knew, just like all of us, we can look fine on the outside, but we're a mess inside. So we can do the right things, but not with the right attitudes. Inside us, what is there? There's a war. There's a tug of war. 
and we struggle. We struggle. And some of you maybe struggled this very mor morning. You were dragging along old weight, old baggage, old attitudes, old regrets of our failures. And by the way, resentments of other people's failures. Sometimes we pick up that in our truck and drag it along. And that leaves us drained and weary and defeated and hopeless. I know some of you are thinking, is this going to get better? <laughs> yeah, it does. Because sometimes we need a clear diagnosis of what's wrong with us. And then we need the cure. Romans 8 is like the sun rising after a very dark night. It is breaking the power of that darkness. Romans 8 is the cure. Romans 8 is the gospel. And Romans 8 gives us the power, the power behind us, behind it. Romans 8 is the love of God, the Father personally, directly to us. Romans 8 is Jesus who personally defeated the power of sin and the Holy Spirit who wins the war. And that's what we're looking for, right? We need to, to, to win this war. And it's the Holy Spirit who does that. So if you have your hand out right before you, please hold it before you because it's really critical. I love just seeing the words exactly before us and printed page. I like to have a pen in my hand. And if you don't have your pen, um, then look for it. Is anybody missing a pen? Anybody missing a pen? Because I'm just going to ask you, who believes in this room that this is the word of God? Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. And, and, and we need it. We need it. We do. So if this is the word of God, hold up your pen. That's the fork. That's the fork. And when you put a paper in front of you, that's your plate. That's your plate. So, so please circle that word. Circle that word uh, above in the first line, Jesus. Circle that word right now. And we're just going to go into his presence. And we're going to practice his presence for just a moment. Because that is the most powerful life changer that we can ever do. It's the presence of God. Jesus says, come to me. Jesus says, come to me. Please circle to me. Please circle to me. And who is he talking to? It's every one of us. Because all of us, I feel like we are weary. We are heavy laden. We are concerned. And we are sometimes dragging the past behind. And his promise to us is I. Not a solution just. I, he says, will give you rest. And he said, come closer, stay closer, put a yoke upon yourself, and it's my yoke. So your ear will be close to my ear, to my, to my mouth as I speak to you, and I will give you rest. I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. What a great promise that is a powerful promise, a needed promise, I think an urgent promise for all of us. As we hear these words, we need to press deeper. The presence of the Lord is the greatest life changer that could ever be. This new year, 2021, um, I believe he wants to press us into practicing his personal presence. Again, Jesus says, come to me. And that's the answer of life. And then he steps right into this powerful, powerful text. And he says, after he says, come to me, come to me, he says, basically, we're going to clear the decks. There's no condemnation. And in this beautiful text, he shifts our confidence from ourself, relying upon our self-will, our self-strength, our self, what we know and can do, the shift from trying harder to confidence in the Holy Spirit. And the end of this chapter that we're studying, the 17th verse, that will go thus far this morning, it's reliance upon his love. 
God himself, his love. So back to number one, what we just did, that come to me. None, uh, none of what's written in Romans or any part of the Bible will make sense or be activated in a distant religious experience. I hope we know that. I hope we activate that thought. No, it's not distance. May that be the most important element that we begin this year with. We've not been this way before. We've not been to this year before. And when the children of Israel passed into the promised land, the first thing they were told to do, put the ark first as you cross the Jordan because you've never been there before. We need the word of God to be the light upon our path. And we need to cling to it. We need that. We've not been here before. Um, in January 21, this very day, a lot of things changed. And we will mark a new, a new atmosphere. But some things never change, and that's God's on the throne. God's on the throne, and that's the checkmate that we need. So let's read as we begin this morning. There is now no condemnation. How much condemnation? None. Zero. Nada. No condemnation. To who? Is it conditional? To those who are in, not just nearby or almost there. Come in and him and you who are in Christ Jesus, who don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made us free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh. Well, God just said, well, I got to do it myself. God the Father did by sending his own son in the likeness, in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin. He condemned sin in the flesh. Verse 4 is glorious news to us. That the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, not by trying harder, but Christ in us, him living in us who don't walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So here we see the cure and the come to me and the promises laid before, before us. Romans 8 comes out of the gates with this wonderful news. There's now no condemnation. And basically he's saying, we're clearing the decks here. We're just clearing the decks. You need a clean slate. This is very life-changing. The past is history. And this very day, I believe that he's asking us to leave it, leave it behind. I had an interesting experience uh, just, uh, just maybe last week, maybe seven, ten days ago. And I realized that I'm going to have some company, and they're important company, and they're going to stay for a while. And I have, a, I have two guest rooms and But the problem, as I was laying in bed thinking about it, of what I needed to do to prepare, I realized that those two guest rooms aren't just guest rooms, that uh, they have become the place where I put things um, in my house that don't quite belong anywhere else. So it's become a storage room. And it's kind of hard to get started on how you're going to clean out something. Who, who, I'm, not, I'm, not a, I, I'm not diagnosed as a hoarder. Not officially, but I will tell you that I have a hard time getting rid of things. You know, my house is huge. I have this whole room, and it's just stuff full. And I was laying there, where do I start? And then I could picture that under both beds, twin beds in that room, there are these huge bins, and they are filled with, I'm almost embarrassed to say it with, do you know what this is? It's a VHS tape. Of the, uh, I have, I ha had, up until today, which was garbage day, I had a hundred. I know you're thinking why. And I have the TV and the tape winder. 
I do. But it was hard because I had, I had Toy Story. I had Crocodile Dundee. I mean, you can't even see that anymore. I had The Sound of Music. I had great stuff. Hadn't watched them in five years. And you know what? The Lord just said, it's just time. Because here's the deal. Here's the deal with hanging on to old baggage. It's taking up space. Today was garbage day. I have a garbage can that's taller than me, and we had to use my neighbors. But the sound of the tr garbage truck coming was glory. It was glory today. And God had me tell that story because there are things in your soul that are taking up space. And he wants to get to that. He's not condemning you this morning. He is not condemning you, but he's calling you. He's wooing you. There is time to do the important thing, to say yes. And that word now is circled on my page. It is past time to let those hang, things hang on. The past tapes of your experience in life, the guilt and shame, the things you've done in the past, let them go. I am so proud of our church. Our church is so committed to the cause of freedom that God has raised up counselors, amazing counselors, and, and women here in this very room who had the battle cry, and, and they are just are so determined to spread the message of forgiveness and, and, and to the women of God. And that's so important. Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice. Do you hear that this morning? Somebody really needs, if there's just one of you, this is a life-changing day, and God is saying, this is the day. My sheep hear my voice, and they will follow me. They will not listen to the voice of the stranger because he comes to rob, kill, and destroy. You know, the enemy of our soul, he, first he drags us into sin. He tempts us, drags us into sin, and then shames us and condemns us. He is the accuser of the brethren. And so I'm going to ask you in obedience to God Almighty to choose. Choose to say who you will serve. Will you serve the voice of the enemy who shames you and puts you down and drags your past? Or you say, no, done with you. You're the enemy. You have no part of me. I belong to God. And I'm going to believe him and nobody else because you're a child of God. And that's the message. And it's a now message. There's a, a beautiful study, a beautiful study called Healed and Set Free. And some of you, just the very words are just, are just captivating and they should be because it's, it's the destiny of the child of God. It's a beautiful study. And there was a woman that came to me and said, Debbie, will you go through that study with me? And I said, yes, I would. And we met the first week. I didn't know her well. And she was crying so hard that her nose was running. I'm just being honest. Her nose was running. She could hardly speak. We hardly got through a page of it. And um, it, 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 wow, it was tough. Second week, she came back crying almost as hard. And we got through a couple pages. She told me her story. She told me that she had asked for forgiveness, but she said, I can't forgive myself. Third week, she came to me, and, and she had questions, and they were written on her paper. She said, will God ever forgive me? Will God ever restore me? Will I ever be healed? Will I ever forgive myself? Will I ever be used? And that's when I got bossy. I said, I would like a little eye contact right now. And I said, child of God, you are asking the wrong person. You are asking me, and you are asking yourself. And I asked her to get a spiral notebook and, and just take like 10 pages. And at the top of each page, to ask the question. And then before the question, she would say, Father God. Father God. Jesus. Will I ever be forgiven? Will I ever be free? She was gone on vacation for about two or three weeks. She came back. She walked in that room, and she was a different person. She was a different person because she was finally asking the right questions to the right person. And God shouted out of his word, and this is a shout out for you. 
Maybe you're a mom. And, you know, it's quite, quite true that I know that many of you struggle with failure. Silence from the audience. It's just true. It's just true. We just feel like a failure because who could be successful? I mean, it's just a big job. I mean, really, really. We, you know, it just the whole pile of it and then raising the next generation. I mean, it's just crazy. But you know what? God has a message for you. There's no condemnation. That's XX fashion. You've got something to do. Don't drag the past behind. Don't even drag, drag yesterday behind. You know, don't. Because every day is a new day to a wise, godly woman. And you need to wake up and say, this is the day that the Lord has made. And I will rejoice and I will trust in his love. I will know that he loves me and he is good. No condemnation for you. And at, at the end of this message, we're going to just sit before the Lord and we're going to ask people just actively and aggressively to come for and receive his forgiveness. We're going to do that. We're going to get to it. We're going to judge, like that day that God said, it's time. It's time. And, and all he was depending on me to do was just say yes. And when I said yes, he gave me the plan and he gave me the courage to just clean house. And he's going to give that to you. But now we're going to look at the other side of the coin. There's now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. So we need to be forgiven. But God himself in his word. Jesus our savior. Has another facet. Of freedom that he wants to give to you. It's the freedom of not condemning others. Others. When Jesus taught us to pray. He said our father who art in heaven. Hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And then he said, if you forgive others, I'll forgive you. But then he says, if not... If not, if you will not or feel you cannot forgive, then you're leaving yourself in a vulnerable uh, situation. And he ended the Sermon on the Mount by saying, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Jesus, I can see the expression on his face. He said, I say to you, love your enemy. Bless those that curse you. Do good to those that hate you and spitefully use you, that you will be sons and daughters of your Father in heaven. I just want to say to you, child of God, make your dad proud by letting him set you free. That's old baggage. I'm telling you, the love of God, when I was walking through, I've walked through Romans 8 for the last two months. It's been walking around in me. And about a month ago, his light burst across the scenery and he did something that's not condemnation, but it's a function of the Holy Spirit called another C word, who can guess? Conviction of the Holy Spirit. Conviction of the Holy Spirit. He opened my eyes and my, my, the willingness part of my heart to see that indeed I was very bitter. I, 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 I had it stuffed deep, but I was bitter, a long-term bitterness against somebody. He also showed me I had about four or five resentments. And then I had about four petty annoyances, <laughs> you know. It, it was one of those honest-to-God moments. And he said, we're going to deal with this. We, we are going to deal with this. And he showed me that, that it's not my destiny. And he opened my heart in a supernatural way. 
Let's look at Romans. Let's look on. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. And here's the deal. When we have annoyance or an odd or a grudge or, or whatever you want to name it against somebody, you know what? It occupies our thoughts. You know, we see that person, oh, they, there they go again. <laughs> you know? Holidays come, oh, brother. You know, or, or, or it occupies our thoughts. Right? And we overthink and rethink. Because the carnal mind is an enemy of God. It's not subject to the, to the law of God, nor indeed can be. And the Lord called me. It is carnal and it's selfish and it's wrong to hold these grudges. And I know somebody's sitting in that seat and you just want to run for it because you don't want to have this talk. Well, I know. But it was a father God talk. You know, he ends this whole discussion saying for you to not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you receive the spirit of adoption, whereby we call Abba Father. It's a father talk. It's a father talk. It's not to be mean to us. You're not a child of fear. You're a child of God. Fear has no dominion over you and sometimes we're afraid to let go like they'll get off scot-free you let go and then they're in the hands of God revenge and, and a hateful thoughts and depression over the past that's not his will he goes on to say that the spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God and of children listen very carefully verse 17 if you're a child of God, you are rich. Don't you think you're poor? Don't you think you're poor? You are rich. You are an heir, an heir of God and joint heirs with Christ. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may be glorified together. It's very important now that we will look at the how. Because this is impossible with all things. With all things, the Bible says God all things are possible with God. And remember, remember Paul had this thorn on the flesh that made him weak. Remember that moment in, in, in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? He just struggled with something and he couldn't get rid of it. And we don't know what it was. Maybe it was physical. Maybe, maybe it was an old bitterness. Just couldn't shake it. He couldn't shake it. And he asked God to take it away whatever it is, and that makes us think maybe it was physical. But God said, mm, mm I'll tell you what I will give you, grace, grace. In your weakness, my strength is perfected. He gives us grace. When we say yes to God, he climbs into the trenches. He shows us how, and he gives us the strength. And let's back up to this wonderful verse, 11. And this is a clincher. That's why it's highlighted. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through the spirit who dwells in you. Again, child of God, here's the power punch. How hard was it to raise Jesus from the dead? He was beaten to a bloody pulp. He was wounded. He was ridiculed. He was stripped. And he was nailed to the cross. When he died and said it's finished, they took him down and put him in a tomb and rolled the stone in front of it. And here's the deal. God still moves stones. And the spirit that raised that dead body will give life to whatever is dead in you. Somebody here, you're very angry at your husband. And maybe you're keeping calm about it. But it torments you. You can't forgive. Maybe you can't, but Christ in you can. 
It's for freedom that he set you free. The spirit who raised Jesus from the dead. Maybe there's something you know you're supposed to do in this aspect. And God's personalizing you. There was a man who came into the, to the synagogue one day and he had a, a crippled hand. And yet maybe no one even knew it because he kept it covered up because they had these robes. And Jesus that very day called him out, said, come forward into the middle of the room. And you know that's the last thing you want. When you got something wrong with you, something crippled, something shrunk up, you don't want to step into the light. He said, come in the light. And he did. And then Jesus asked him, commanded him to do something he could not do. Stretch forth that withered hand. And he had a decision. And he only had two choices. And what were they? Yes or no. Now, we think it's maybe. But if we say maybe or not now, you know what it is? It's no. It's no. And God healed that hand as he chose to obey. There's power in the Holy Spirit's presence in your life.